Jai Ma everyone and uh, Bhakti Yoga. We continue our quest in this particular path of inquiry and we take reassurance from the fact that the ancient yogis and yoginis, the ancient rishis and rishikas have walked this path. And this is not a path of blind faith. This is not a path of conversion of our religious beliefs. This is simply a softening of our individual self into our cosmic self. Our individuated consciousness discovering protection, safety, and divine love in cosmic divine consciousness. We have been looking at how the Bhakti Yoga teachings on Ishwara the term to connote the divine everything is not specific to a personality, a person, a deity, but Ishwara comes from the root Sanskrit Isha, which literally means the inner controller, the indwelling power, that indwelling intelligence that is located in every particle of this universe, not to mention that it is the source and sustenance of the sentience and the consciousness and the awareness that we living beings experience. It has been a beautiful journey and what is more, the inquiry into bhakti yoga is not for random reasons. This is a deeply held path because yoga, if I may remind you, comes from the Sanskrit root word yujja. And yujja means union. Union with what? In our everyday lives, we have a lot of moments of union with our, um, with our phone, with our smartphones, with uh, our in-laws, with our neighbors, with our fears and doubts, and with our um, losses and gains. Bhakti yoga and the word yoga specifically here means the path of union with that divine self, the universal self. Not a union that you will experience after death. Not a union that you, you will experience after an elaborate set of rituals. Not a, set, not a union that is uh, awaiting very really difficult um, yogic asanas and breath work. A spontaneous union, a soft union, when we settle and rest at last in this recognition that Ishwara, that great divine Satchit Ananda, that eternal existence, intelligence and joy, that that divinity that is beyond gender, beyond form, is dwelling within us, all around us and beyond us. It is imminent and immanent. It is transcended at the same time. And yet it is imminent. And that when we start having that conviction that we are not spiritual orphans, when we start having this conviction that even if I speak to a lump of clay, I am talking to Ishwara because Ishwara's ancient, Ishwara's consciousness dwells in every particle of this universe. When we start having that conviction because we have understood scientifically, systematically about Ishwara's presence through the speech of our teacher and through the teachings of the Upanishads, then we develop what is known as Shraddha. And that Shraddha then flowers into what is 
the teaching of bhakti. So they are connected. But before bhakti, because bhakti can come and go and we can feel uh, um, doubtful, we can feel alone, we can um, have some religious interpretation of uh, Ishwara, and we can have some expectations which are socialized and culturalized. But when we have Shraddha in place, when we are showing up again and again, again and again, to listen to a teacher of the tradition who does not make up stories but merely imparts to you what has been imparted for thousands of years, has been known and checked for thousands of years that Ishwara is, that this is the only present and everything comes and goes. This is the ultimate existence. That does not, That is not ephemeral. It is the ultimate intelligence. Then, then the learnings of bhakti literally become almost like a heart-based, bhava-based, emotion-based connection with divinity. Yes, we have included religious sentiment in it, but if you ask me, it's really between you and that ultimate source. It's private. It's a private matter. Bhakti is, a, is an emotion of love, marked by spontaneous experience of feeling engulfed by Ishwara and, uh, and, and sparking within us intense devotion and, and attachment to that which is abstract, invisible, yet all-pervading. So in bhakti, one literally falls in love with the concept of divine consciousness and evolves in one's own consciousness as a result. And because through, through, through the teachings of the Upanishads, we recognize that this is not the divinity that belongs to one people, the brown-colored people who live on the other side of the Ganga, that this is about a universal truth. A, a truth that is behind the sun shining, the wind blowing, the flowers blooming, emerging and disappearing through beings, that truth. And that it is not only all-pervading, but that it's resident in our own heart. Then in bhakti, the ego melts. But the sense of me and mine and what can I accumulate and what can I shun, it starts calming down a bit. So the either the ego becomes small, 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 and it becomes almost atomic, shining with all the other atoms of this universe with Ishwarahood, which is not an anthropomorphic god, but a divinity that is that is beyond universal, <laughs> beyond expansive. Or the ego becomes big, 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 because it becomes so big that it can hold everything small in its heart. So the ego definitely does not remain rigid. That's what happens in bhakti. So shraddha leads to bhakti. And then do you know what happens? Bhakti, the more you keep staying connected to these teachings of bhakti yoga, they are leading you um, into the next stage of bhakti, which is dhyana. You go into a spontaneous meditation. You see spring blossoming and you don't just see the fact of spring. You see the presence of divine light. You go into a meditative state. You see people who are loving you and you experience a meditative state through receiving that love. And when you see people plotting and planning against you and betraying you and hurting you, you still are able to see through your inner eyes Again, through a meditative place of, okay, bring it on. This must be happening for a reason. For me to see through this and to be detached from this. So, Shraddha, Bhakti, Dhyana. It goes into another state of Dhyana. Dhyana is a Sanskrit word which means meditation. And meditation is not just close your eyes, sit with your mind straight, take a deep breath, 
Now you watch your thoughts, don't attach with any thoughts. That's just one way of entering dhyana. But sometimes when you have shraddha, and then you have allowed the bhakti blossoms to, um, to emerge spontaneously in the field of your heart, then you go into a spontaneous state of meditative existence. And finally, as per the Kavalya Upanishad, Saddha Bhakti Dhyana Yoga Tavehi. This leads to this meditative experience, this meditative living, this meditative behavior, this meditative talking, this meditative understanding of the good and bad, the ugly and the lovely, the temporal. The, 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 the ugliness, the death, the impermanence, and yet to be able to experience the permanence of something divine, that leads to a state of union yoga. So remember this, sattha, conviction. And how do you get that conviction? How are you getting that conviction? Through reminders in the Vedic way. Through reminders for a whole year. For a whole year, I will teach bhakti yoga. And then you will spontaneously move into karma yoga, all of you. And then from karma yoga into pasna, and then from a pasna into gyan for the ultimate self-realization. I'm not aware of such a systematic curriculum elsewhere, but I thought, let me try this. And I want to ask you in a minute, if you are experiencing these moments Shraddha turning into bhakti, love, into a meditative experience, mindfulness, dhyana, into a state of like, I'm not alone. An experience of your inner power, your inner peace, your inner calmness. You are because you are now in a state of yoga. So I'm going to take a moment now and I will take your feedback. Write me a moment here where you are experiencing a moment of yoga, a moment of union. And what's that moment of union? It's not something where you start sparking with stars, but it's a moment of deep down being held and deep down being surprised by your own expansiveness, your own blessedness. Share with me just this one word. If you're experiencing a moment of yoga, just write moment. Because some of you have been forced to bhakti yoga now for a few weeks. Some of you may be new, but you may be experiencing that moment even now. Let me see. If you're getting those moments, I see that quite a few of you are writing moments. Now, let me congratulate you. Do you know how many lifetimes you have come and gone and how many wombs and how many stories of dukkha, sukha, joy and sorrow to come to this moment where you've had a moment of union with your divine parent, your divine soul. We don't need to give it an official name. It need not be a Hindu god, a Jew god, a Sikh god, a Buddhist god. It can include all those gods, and yet it can transcend all them too. Because it, 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 we cannot conceive of it. Can we really give it an adjective? Religions have boldly tried to do that, and I compliment them for it. They make it available for the masses. Give it a contour of oh God wears, Hindu god wears sari, and Christian god wears robes. Hey, but we are philosophers, we yogis, we go where religions don't take us. We go and see the God that takes care of every tadpole, every bacteria, every virus, every sand, every particle, every star, every black hole. All of that is conceived in this Godness, what I call the divine allness. In fact, I've broken up the word G-O-D into great omniscient dimension. And you, because of your few weeks 
of exposure to Shraddha curriculum, Bhakti curriculum, is now moving into states of meditative yoga union. I congratulate each one of you. May you continue, um, the word is pumping this journey, really juicing it, really working on it, because a state comes a state comes where you are not just begging and pleading for a happy life. You become the creator, sustainer, and destroyer of your own life script. That is the true godly thing to do. Where you no longer remain a victim. Where you no longer remain someone with a begging bowl in front of um, some symbol of God. But you truly are experiencing those divine feminine divine masculine powers within you. That is the goal of bhakti. <clears throat> that is when you start experiencing in their fullness the three shaktis or the three powers I talked about power to know what is the greater truth for you. The power to will and the power to act. You truly become not just lost actors in a random script in a forgotten theater, but awakened ship writers of your own destiny. I believe that some of you have been studying with me, not just bhakti yoga, but for some time you have been studying with me. Please tell me if you are experiencing to some degree the sovereignty, which has now been strengthened by bhakti yoga, to learn about divinity, not just as far away beyond the clouds, somewhere in your religious version of a heaven or a platform where Godness exists. But to see it all around you, in the good, bad, the ugly, lovely, the dark, the light, and then to see it within you as your own asthma. How has that been? Has this strengthened your sovereignty as writers of your own destiny? Write me the word sovereignty if you're experiencing it as a result. When you write that, you help each other in believing that we're not talking about miracles that happen to one person and everybody else just looks at them with vacant eyes saying, well, how come they get to be the lucky ones? They don't have to pay a lot of money to some person to make that miracle happen for them. They don't have to stand on one foot in the river Ganga and chant a million mantras to make it happen. It can happen right now where you are. There you go. Many of you are writing that. And I once again commend you on this journey. And this sovereignty is being experienced more and more due to the path of yoga. And in fact, I have been deliberating as a teacher as to from the various pathways that I have inherited from my teacher and that I'm a teacher of in a complete way. There are teachers of Ayurveda. There are teachers of um, Vedanta or Advaita Vedanta, non-dual philosophy. There are teachers of yoga philosophy. I'm a teacher of all of these. And uh, I was wondering, you know, as I gather more focus in my um, you know, last or so decades of teaching in my senior years, which one do I want to focus upon? And I realized I wanted to focus upon the yogas because this is the only answer to the complete suffering and self-sabotage. We are, we are hurting others and we are self-sabotaging our journey. And really with bhakti yoga, like I said, you're either your ego will become small so it can be protected or it will become so big that it can protect others. It will not remain in a um, in a ugly, dispossessed, bloated, contorted space. 
where it hurts itself, where it, where it incessantly fills you with the demons of doubt, demons of hatred, demons of um, separation, and where it, because it's connected to its divine source, it unleashes within you some invincible traits, emotional resilience, wisdom, discernment, ability to take right decisions at the right time, the ability to say no, and it has the power of the goddess in it, and the ability to say yes, and it has the power of the goddess in it. To really truly lead a charm life, bhakti yoga is the way, because our ego, we can take it and try and clean it up of all its traumas, but it just never ends, does it? Or we can just simply put it back and reconnect it to the source it came from, and it becomes automatically purified. 